I'm Eleanor Wachtel, and this is Writers in Company. Today, looking back at the foremost 20th century writer from Sudan, Tayeb Salih. A mix of East and West, European modernist, and classical Arabic. لكن تلك قصة أخرى المهم أنني عدت وبي شوق عظيم إلى أهلي في تلك القرية الصغيرة عند منحنى النيل Tayeb Salih, reading from the beginning of his landmark novel, Season of Migration to the North. It's been translated from Arabic into more than 30 languages. In 2001, it was declared to be the most important Arabic novel of the 20th century. It was also voted one of the 100 best works of fiction, period, in 2002. Tayeb Salih was born in a village on the Nile in northern Sudan in 1929. From an early age, he had a facility with words and a love of literature. Both Arabic and the English he was taught in school, since until 1956, the Sudan was a colony of Britain. As he said, I grew up in the 30s and 40s when my country had no need for writers, although there is a tradition of scholarship in the Sudan. It rather needed doctors, engineers, and teachers, he continued. However, you get committed against your will. You write, and writing starts exercising its own life. Tayeb Salih went to university in England before working at the BBC as head of drama in the Arabic service. He later worked as Director General of Information in Qatar and with UNESCO in Paris and in the Persian Gulf. His first book, The Wedding of Zayn, was made into a movie and won a prize at the Cannes Film Festival. Bandershaw came out in English in the late 1990s, but he's best known for his 1967 novel, Season of Migration to the North. Described by Edward Said as one of the finest works of modern Arabic literature, it continues to engage and fascinate readers around the world. It's such a powerful and current book that was banned at universities in Sudan, and there was even talk of a fatwa. Season of Migration to the North is told by a young man who returns to his village along the Nile after studying in Europe for seven years. The narrator is a kind of Marlowe figure from Conrad's Heart of Darkness, and also a kind of alter ego for Tayeb Salih himself. He tells the story of another Sudanese who studied abroad, Mustafa Said, a haunting tale of mystery and darkness. Tayeb Salih explores the confrontation between West and East, city and village, North and South, exile and return, even past and present in this remarkable novel. Tayeb Salih died in 2009, a few months short of his 80th birthday. When I went to see him at his home in the suburbs of London near Wimbledon in 2002, he was 72 and officially retired, but he was traveling frequently to talk about his work. I remember I caught up with him between Cairo and Frankfurt, as his unpacked bags were still standing in the hallway. Tayeb Salih was a warm, gracious host who clearly enjoyed conversation. I'd like to begin with with the Nile River. You write in your novel, Bandershah, that the, the river gives its eternal muffled scream into the ear of the bank. And the bank understands nothing, and the river can do nothing but speak. <laughs> Growing up along the Nile, did, did it speak to you? I think so, yes. If one uh, lives in a northern Sudanese village by the Nile, it, it's a very overpowering presence. It rises in floods and goes down, sometimes... The floods are devastating. And, of course, the whole of life is tied up with the river. I was always fascinated by the river from my very early childhood. And I think I understood somewhat what the river is trying to say. Were there, I mean, was it a source of, of myth and folklore? Because one gets the sense that it, it, it's, 
it, it, it feeds the imagination as well as feeding the, the, the community and uh, affecting the community so much in terms of, of you know, rising and falling and flooding and the cycles of nature. Yes, you know, of course, that uh, the ancient Sudanese civilization and the Egyptian pharaonic civilization, they, they worshipped the Nile and sacrificed to it. And it is uh, continually demonstrating its power. I mean, uh, strange strange people turn up. In in my work, one notices the river throws up strangers to these villages, uh, people who look differently, sometimes too white, sometimes too black, sometimes like mystics, sometimes weird characters. So, yeah, there is a great deal of mythology uh, woven around the, the Nile. Tayeb Sali, you, you've said that above all else, the foundation of my work lies in what I am, a Sudanese Muslim Arab who was born at a certain time in a certain place. Can you tell me about that place? Can you describe it for me? I'll try. Um this place, it is bigger than a village and smaller than a town. It is very ancient, uh, that is uh, known from the historical records. A place called Debba, on the point of the great loop of the Nile, almost in the middle between Khartoum and Wadi Halfa, which is on the on the borders with Egypt. This place, according to an an English historian called Crawford, who wrote uh, about the the old uh, Sudanese kingdom of the Funj of Sinar, it used to be a kind of sanctuary, religious sanctuary, because it's it's always been a place of worship from before Islam. And then we had, of course, the ancient religions, and then we had Christianity, and then we had Islam, one on top of the other. An Italian priest visited this place. I think, if my memory doesn't fail me, Uh, in the 16th century. And he discovered that it was full of Quranic schools and religious people, theologians and so on, all devoted to study. And it was considered a, a kind of sanctuary that if a person committed a crime anywhere in the country, and then came to that place, the government could not pursue them to that extent. It's no longer a sanctuary, I'm afraid, but it still has the remnants of its uh, old uh, religious character. How does it show up at, at this point? Well, by, by the, the number of people who know Koran by heart, by the schools, the Quranic schools, very ancient, and the old way of learning to read and write and so on. But it is changing. When you were growing up, uh, can you tell me about your family? What what did your father do when you were in that village? I come from, actually, um, I think an interesting family, mainly farmers, we always had a, a plot of land, not uh, too big to make us feudal people, and not too small, which the family farmed. Uh, also, on my mother's side, my people belong to the r- religious teachers. And there was also a streak of um, capitalism in the family. It's a family which is 
got rich and, and poor and then rich again and poor again. <laughs> and when I was born, it was in, in the dump side. It, it was in the poor part. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it was... Um, it it was a reasonable life. I didn't suffer much. Can you describe the the household or the house that you were in? Yes, uh, we have in this area, as along the whole of the northern Sudan, uh, big houses built of mud and thatched with the branches of date palms. Very very nice houses with huge courtyards where in, 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 in the hot climate there at night, people sleep in the courtyard. And that's, that's, um, that was our house too. A big family? Yes, a very big family, like all families in the Sudan actually, including the South. One belonged to a, an extended family. When I was born, all my grandfathers were alive, and uh, all the uncles from both sides, and we all lived in, in, in a kind of estate, you know. And one didn't know until rather late in life who whose father was or whose mother was, you know, because every house was one's house. Uh, and we called everybody father, everybody, every lady mother, every relative, that is. The Sudan was historically a crossroads, uh, linking southern Africa with the Mediterranean and the southern Sahara with the Red Sea. You said that that encouraged tolerance, uh, the kind of tolerance that you show among the, the people of your fictional village, Wad Hamid. How did you experience that cultural mix as a child? The tolerance actually, uh, I think, was the result of so many historical factors besides the geographical location of the place. Because as I said earlier, uh, this place knew many religions. One existed on top of the other, and people didn't didn't fight over religion. When Islam came to the Sudan, this part of the country had been Christian probably for uh, more than uh, six hundred, seven hundred years. And the Muslims did not fight, did not win the country by conquest, like in uh, greater Syria or even Egypt or North Africa. What they did, um, they, they stayed along and intermarried with the royal family, the royal Christian families of the region, whose daughters inherited the, 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 the kingdoms, not the sons, you see. So in a few generations, the sons of the Muslims from the daughters of the Christian kings became the rulers. And it, it also, later on, the religion was spread by mystics who came from uh, North Africa, from Egypt, from Iraq, and so on. It was a peaceful transformation. And I think this left its marks or mark on the Sudanese character until this very day. That's why the, 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 I know you are thinking of the war in the South. How come then that there is a religious war in the South? This, to my mind, is a great aberration, something totally out of character with the country. One got uh, a regime which somehow thought they would create a Muslim state in the Sudan. Again, it's all historical logic. The majority of the southern Sudanese are not uh, Muslims. 
So you got this strange situation. I'm sure it will go, and the Sudan, like the Nile, will go back to its uh, old rhythm. Because you, you said that the, the kind of Islam that was practiced when you were growing up was was more spiritual or mystical and not ideological or, or, or fanatical or anything like that. Quiet, yes. Was your own upbringing religious? No, I mean, one learned the... Um, I went to the... Um, what we call the Kutab. The Kutab is, is a school where you learn the rudiments of Quran and reading and writing and religion. It was the only school available, actually. But uh, there was no indoctrination. I, I don't remember being forcefully indoctrinated uh, by the, the, the religion. Were you inclined towards it? Was it a source of inspiration for you or a shaping influence, do you think? Oh, of course, no doubt. I mean, I, I love the Quran even before I understood fully what it meant because Quran, the Quran is the the residue, the essence of the Arabic language, and, and nobody can can claim to know Arabic without knowing the Quran. I met many, many Arab Christians who loved the Quran as a language. So I, I uh, was attracted to that from the very beginning. Then the chanting sometimes and the uh, on, on uh, weddings and when we had, we still do in the Sudan, we have groups of singers who chant the praises of the Prophet. They go from village to village, and they sing that in lovely choral voices, and the whole village comes out and listens. I I also love that. The essence of things, if I may say, uh, got through to me without any undue harshness or compulsion. Can you elaborate on that when you say the essence? Well, there it is. I mean, um, one just absorbed through a kind of, if I may use the word, symbiotic process, the essence of the, the, the existence of the people on this part of the earth. And I think I had the sense of that happening, my own family, other families, and so on. And that's what interested me. Until now, I, the, the part of Islam which attracts me is mysticism. The great mystics in Islam, of course, are, are, are great poets, you know, like uh, Al-Attar, uh, the Persian, or Ibn Arabi, the, um, the Andalusian. It, it, these people... Uh, I think express the essence of of the religion as a kind of uh, search of of humanity for the truth, whatever it is. Tayeb Sali, I'd like to talk about Wad Hamid, the fictional village at the center of your work. Now, it's I think it's a little smaller than your own village. But it occupies a large psychic space for your characters because it, it seems to be a place of both myth and reality. I, mean, I think as one character says in, in my season of migration to the north, I used to treasure within me the image of this little village, seeing it wherever I went with the eye of my imagination. Mm. How real is Wad Hamid? Um, as you said, uh, you, you, you described it precisely. It's only real in the sense that art can be real. Um, I make it small uh, if I want, because I want to make a point. And then I make it big when I want. It is, it is elastic uh, in my imagination. 
but it's also an overpowering presence. I used when I was very little, I thought it was huge, and then as I grew older, then I saw how physically smaller it was. But it 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 saw many 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 things, being where it is in the Sudan and what it represented. Landscape in your fiction is is vivid and symbolic. A tree isn't just a tree. What's that about that that powerful connection that you show us between the people and and their environment? I think I got this from growing up in this village in in the northern Sudan because in these places, as in indeed in other parts of the world, where life uh, hasn't become corrupted totally. I mean, corrupted sometimes uh, is is described as progress. It, it's a corruption of the intimate relationship between the living elements and the inanimate elements in nature. In places like this, every bit of the landscape has a character. One knows, you know, the little risings in, in the dunes and the, the little bushes and the trees. And there is, um, there is actually a living spirit, really, in, in these places. The narrator in Season of Migration to the North says that uh, by the standards of the European industrial world, we are poor peasants. But when I embrace my grandfather... I experience a sense of richness as though I am a note in the heartbeats of the very universe. Did you have a grandfather like that? Yes, I did. I was actually obsessed with my grandfather. And I always, I used to say that I didn't have an Oedipus complex. I had a grandfather complex. He was physically uh, very prominent. He was very tall. And he, for me, he represented all wisdom. He worked hard all his life. Uh, He had many, many children. And uh, he, he was also articulate. I used to sit with him for hours. And I, I learned a great deal from him. He lived, uh, he claimed that he, was 120 years old. I don't know how true that was. But when he died, he was he had his teeth, all his teeth in his mouth, his eyesight was good. He never became bedridden. So for me, he was almost like an element of nature, like a big tree or, or the river itself. When you say obsessed, I mean, can you, what? No, uh, I meant probably fascinated. But um, I understood how significant this person was from very early on. Tayyip Sali, your, your novella, The Wedding of Zane, features as its central character a, a, a charming misfit, a, a kind of comical character, a, a a, a, a lovable freak in a way, spirited and passionate. He's treated mostly with affection by the community, and in fact he comes to be seen as, as special, as a, a kind of holy fool. Where did he come from? Um, you know, since I, I wrote that um, novel, I met so many people, not only in the Sudan actually, in other Muslim countries, who who told me that there were characters in their villages, Upper Egypt or in, uh, in, in, in Syria or Iraq, that were, they were exactly like Zin. These characters exist in all Muslim countries, and the, the way the community protects them is to impart a degree of holiness on them so they do not become misfits. The word does not exist in our vocabulary. The, the community 
treats them as blessed people. Uh, and they become blessed, actually. I may have met some such uh, people. And But in your story, it used him to to show a very positive picture of a community, a, a very harmonious, embracing, generous kind of community yes. in, the, in the way they relate to him and the way he relates yes, to them. Yes, yes. I think, I think that's not an exaggeration, really. That's, that's the way I remember this village when I was growing up in the 40s. One of the things that that surprised me in in the wedding of Zayn, uh, with, within that her- harmonious environment, was that uh, Zayn and the Imam didn't get along. No, he was the one person that Zayn yeah. disliked, and, yes. uh, and even though there was a uh, others who regarded Zayn as 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 in some way holy or mm. uh, sent by God in in a lowly human form or something. Yeah, what, what what's that about? Well, to start with, Zain, I think, instinctively felt that the imam didn't have this spiritual ability to to see the the real value of of people of of things, because the imam was educated in the azhar. You know, he had a, what you could call a modern <laughs> education, and he despised the people in the village, because he considered them as all uh, ignoramuses. And he was not a loving man, because the uh, the Zain was a, a loving person, and he reacted with love towards those who should love. So is it significant, or does it reflect your own view, that the uh, official religious man, the, uh, the imam, is an outsider who's not so sympathetic and the other Well, he's not an outsider. He's one of the community, but he cast himself in the role of the outsider by setting himself above other people. There are also some remarkable women in your fictional village, uh, ex- extraordinary women, young or old or strong and assertive even within the constraints of the society. There, there's Zane's bride, a very serious young woman, Ima, who forces her father to let her go to elementary school and be the only girl to be the, studying the Koran. Uh, there's Hosna in Season of Migration to the North, who vows to kill her new husband and herself if she's forced to remarry. Hmm. And uh, and Mariam in, in, in Bandershaw, whose, yeah. whose way it was to think that everything was possible. Hmm. Did you know women like this? Yeah, I did. Probably my mother, my own mother was like that. Although she, she wasn't as rebellious, but um, uh, I think she could have been like that. I met yes in in these villages there are some remarkable uh, ladies, very intelligent, instinctive poets, articulate everything. The idea, you see, um, in in the West, and that, of course, is being dealt with very eloquently with with the man I admire greatly, Professor Edward Said, how an image is created and then people just go on sticking to it. The idea of an, uh, a woman in Muslim countries is that she is subdued and she has no will of her own, and she is um, subservient. This is total, This is not my experience, uh, and I'm sure this is not the experience of any person from from any Muslim country. These women are very vital, you know, very important elements in the society, but they fulfill the role in a quiet manner. But if needs be, they can they can go to extremes like uh, the, the person I did, yeah. You also have I think in terms of your tough women, uh, Bint Majzub, who is like one of the guys. <laughs> Indeed, yes. And this type exists as well. All over the the, the Muslim world. 
Thayab Sali, journeys or migrations and returns are a theme of your fiction. Can you tell me about your own journey? When did you first leave your village? I first le- left my village to go to what is called, was called in those days, the intermediate school. When you started to learn English for the first time, and that led to the secondary school. In our day in the Sudan, that is, I think that was in 46, there was one, only one secondary school in the whole of the Sudan, which started as Gordon, the Gordon Memorial College. You know, General Gordon is the famous um, Governor General of the Sudan, who was uh, killed uh, by the Mahdists, the Mahdi Revolution, against the Turks, as a matter of fact. He was Governor General on behalf of the Ottoman um, Sultan. And this is a, uh, a famous phase in the history of the Sudan. So when the British conquered the Sudan in, in 1898, they created a Gordon Memorial College. By the time I came in, it, uh, it turned into a kind of um, nucleus for a college. So that's that was when I first left my village. And from there, it was natural that if you wanted to continue your education, you would go to London. Yeah. Uh, I rather rushed things, actually. How old were you? Uh, when I came, I was, I think, 23 or 24 uh, uh, to London. When you say you rushed things a little, in what way? Well, because soon after I came here, Sudan gained her independence. And if I had waited, uh, maybe I would have been saved um, many tribulations. <laughs> In what way? Well, you know, I'm, I mean, um, because that became an exile, an optional, voluntary exile. And then I became something of an outsider. Your novel, Season of Migration to the North, is a story of a return, a a tale within a tale. And and both the narrator and and the mysterious man at the center of the story, Mustafa Saeed, have returned from studying in Europe. Saeed's story is, is a disturbing and ultimately tragic one. Where did it come from? I mean, this this it's I mean it's a it's a book with layers of mystery, and there is a heart of darkness at the, at the center. And where where did that darkness come from? Well, it wasn't. It was certainly not from my own experiences. I mean, I had the usual experiences of adapting to an alien environment but nothing um, like the experiences of this strange character. In those days, of course, there was a great deal of discussion about colonialism and African countries and Asian countries and so on were um, struggling to gain their independence. And probably that is my contribution to a kind of um, anti-colonialist statement. Anti-colonialist because of the damage that the colonial power does when when this character goes to, to London, what happens to him in, in that sense? I don't know. You know, the, the character was in himself. He was prone to damage in any way. But, uh, and he shouldn't have, because they were good to him. I mean, they they didn't um, do him personally any harm. 
uh, because he got the chance to go to Egypt, then he came here, I think he went to Oxford or something. Colonialism in itself, as you know, is, is, is problematic. Uh, first, by definition, uh, for a people to impose their will on other people is wrong, of course. And you could call it evil, because everybody is entitled to be free. On the other hand, some forms of colonialism have done some good. The British colonialism in the Sudan, at least in the last phase, that is about 30 years of their 60 years in the Sudan, they, they were very good, they were just, they understood the nature of the community, and they ruled it with a measure, a great measure of wisdom. And yet they were an alien people. They, they had no reason to be there. I think there is a kind of dialectic in this novel about these things. Because you said that season of migration to the north, uh, you were writing about the confrontation between the Arab Muslim world and the Western European one, and that you had redefined the so-called East-West relationship as essentially one of conflict. Uh, yes, I did say that. But at the time I was writing, there was what could be called a conflict between the Muslim world the Arab Muslim world, to be exact, and the West, because at the time there was the great Algerian struggle for independence against France. France is a country I dearly love, uh, with its lovely culture and poets and, and everything. But at the time it was, for us, it represented evil. Then uh, there was the Egyptian revolution under Nasser and the British-French-Israeli interventions, which, of course, we, all of us in the, in the area, considered to be an attempt to, to kill this, this glimmer of hope, we thought. And then, of course, there, were, there was and still is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So all these things at the time exercised our imagination. And I could not write like um, the very big writers uh, before me, Tawfiq al-Hakim from... Egypt, and Suhail Idris from Lebanon, Yahya Haqi from Egypt. These people went to the West, and they felt the difference and the difficulties, and the novels showed a kind of enchantment with the West, which was quite proper at the time. I mean, if one reads uh, the descriptions of Paris uh, now, it was mainly in France, in Paris, which is another reason, because Paris is a very seductive city. And if I were writing in Paris, probably I may have t toned down my, <laughs> my anger. But I could not write other than the way I did. Anyway, th these days, no Christian is fully Christian, no Muslim is fully Muslim, and the, the world is getting all mixed up, and it is very difficult, uh, as far as I can tell, to draw lines. There are conflicts between specific nations for specific reasons, and I don't believe this can all be mixed up and say there, there is a conflict of civilizations. But the idea of contamination or cor corruption runs through season of migration to the north. The idea 
that not just colonialism but any contact between cultures is destructive. I mean, at one point the narrator reflects that I am from here just as the date palm standing in the courtyard of our house has grown in our house and not anywhere else's. The fact that they come to our land, I know not why, does that mean that we should poison our present and our future? It's a, it's a very powerful metaphor. Yeah, but I, I don't think I meant that the contact itself is poisonous. It's what happens due to the contact and the attempts to drive out the results uh, of this contact. Uh, of course, as, as you, you know, it, it all depends on the way these things happen. If there is a, a genuine, peaceful exchange of ideas, experiences, etc., the, the result re- tends to, to stay, and people do not fight against it. In any case, in those days, we were wary of what came to us from the West because we felt that this was an attempt to usurp our identity and make us just, you know, docile satellites of the West. And I must say this feeling still persists in some places. The the troubled man at the center of that novel, Saeed, himself uses this same metaphor of poison. When he goes to England, he says, My dear sir, as I come in as as an invader into your very homes, a drop of the poison which you have injected into the veins of history, I am no Othello. Othello was a lie. What does he mean by that? (laughs) This is... (laughs) This is, uh, of course, uh, a difficult question because I made a um, deliberate play by bringing in the image of Othello. The assumption was that Othello was a lie in the sense... He's, he's a lie in the sense that he is not real, he's not a historical character. But I always felt when I read Othello or saw it acted that there was something wrong with it, great as it is. And then I thought, probably mistakenly, I mean, it is a great, um, one cannot quibble with Shakespeare, great arrogance on my part. But I felt probably because the reasons Shakespeare gives to the, to the tragedy in Othello are not sufficient. Othello was more or less like a Sudanese Arab, a black Moor, and he became the commander of the Venetian army, which is like becoming the commander of, of the superpower. Of course, the United States later on made Colin Powell the the, the commander of the of the superpower army, but in those days it looked so impossible. And uh, Shakespeare gives jealousy, you see, and then this jealousy is stirred up by Iago. I just felt this man couldn't be so naive, I and mean, you know. And I decided that the the real reasons were cultural and and reasons of identity because he was never accepted in 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 the Venetian community, and I don't think they would have made him commander in chief or let him marry this society lady Desdemona. <laughs> anyway, that's one one of my. Uh, erroneous um, views, maybe not not very erroneous. I was young at the time and rather impulsive. And um, it, it somehow worked, I think. Just playing, having him play, this, this mm. misfit, this man between, yeah. between cultures. Yeah. 
Tayeb Sali, you wrote a sequel to The Wedding of Zayn and, and Season of Migration to the North in a book called Bandershah, and we're back in Wat Hamid, but it's 20 years later where, as one of the characters puts it, where things are the same but different. Mm, mm. What did you want to describe in this novel? Well, I wanted actually, the title Bandar Shah comes from Persian, Bandar, in Persian is city, Shah is king. And I don't know honestly why I chose that name. It just came to me. But I wanted to explore the question of the city and the king. It's an old theme because we became independent and all these people you see in you meet in the wedding of Zain have grown older and things happened to them. Mahjoub, for example, became a, a, a sort of a politician, you know. And I wanted to, to explore that with the vague notion that history repeats itself. Well, it's one of those things where everything is the same but different, or the, the, a character who wakes up one morning and says, suddenly we were certain of nothing. I mean, there's just this kind of, yes. things are a bit yes, uncertain. Yes. I wanted actually to go also back to the history of the Sudan and see whether there is anything to justify the great mess which we made of our independence after the British left because we didn't handle things i.e. the politicians we didn't handle things very well we didn't manage our affairs very well we have a war which has been going on since the very time we gained our independence between the south and north And that does not indicate that we are doing very well. Is there anything in our history which justifies that? Or in the intervention of of other people? How do you see the Sudan now? I mean, it's uh, it's suffered continual political upheaval, coups, internal conflict famine, poverty, displacement. How how do you see the country now? Well, I haven't been to the Sudan for the duration of the present regime because from the very start I expressed my uh, dislike of this regime because I believe in democracy and I believe the Sudanese are capable of creating a democratic state. They are a very civilized people, very disciplined people, if handled well. But uh, by general consensus, I don't think the Sudan did as well as it should have. In fact, it did much worse than it should have done. Is there a family there? I have remnants of my family, yes. I have cousins and uh, nephews and nieces and so on. My sister lives there. You're in touch? Oh, yes. We meet outside the Sudan. Does Wad Hamid still exist for you? I mean, do you return to it, perhaps to your own village uh, along the Nile in, in your memory or imagination? Oh, yes, yes. It does, yes. Very clear to me very vivid and it is um, it is of course in the old songs which are becoming popular now there is a great phase of nostalgia in the Sudan to the world I I describe in the wedding of Zain and so on and the there is a flourishing of art in the diaspora the very talented Sudanese painters, singers, musicians, poets, and all these people are harking back to an earlier, uh, better phase of the Sudan. 
Do you ever dream about uh, your village? Yes, I do. I do. I have dreams of my parents and grandfather and uh, uncles and so on. Yes, over the years, it uh, dreams are, of course, um, as they say, are a kind of uh, cinema. They keep me entertained and disturbed sometimes and amused sometimes. And my mother, I see my mother quite often. It's a really great pleasure to have the chance to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've been very, very happy to meet you. Sudanese writer Tayeb Soli at his home in London in 2002. The Wedding of Zayn and Season of Migration to the North are part of the Heinemann African Writers Series, and Bandershaw is published by Keegan Paul International. Tayeb Soli died in 2009. He was 79. Writers and Company is produced by Sandra Rabinovich. Katie Swales is associate producer. Technical operations by Derek Vanderwijk. We always like to hear from you. Our email address is writersandco at cbc.ca. The telephone number is 416-205-6631. For news and reviews all about books, check out cbcbooks.ca.